Your world, your challenges, your faith. When faith within engages the world without, there's power. It's living life from the inside out. The tone on social media can be vicious. A lot of us already know that. Today on this Family Life Inside Out podcast, we'll be talking about what we say and maybe some of the reasons behind why we say it. I'm Martha Manikas Foster, and my guest for this conversation is Daniel Darling, an author and communication specialist. His newest book is titled Away With Words, Using Our Online Conversations for Good. Welcome, Daniel, to Inside Out. Well, it's an honor to be here, and thank you for having me. Absolutely. You know, Daniel, I received your book in the mail, but it was reading a conversation online that really got me to go through my pile of books and then read your book. And that's because you were having a conversation with what is a mutual friend of ours on Facebook, and you were in disagreement. But what I saw was respectful disagreement, and I was intrigued. So for people who aren't on social media, would you describe what's often the tone online and why I might be somewhat taken aback or at least impressed by a respectful conversation? Well, I think uh, there's a couple of things that we often misunderstand. I mean, I think, first of all, there's this idea that Christians have that you can either be courageous or you can be civil, but you can't be both. Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15 that um, have an answer for every person for the hope that lies within you, but do it with gentleness and kindness. So courage and civility go together. So if you are kind of standing up for something you believe in, sometimes people say, particularly that that something is kind of at odds with the culture, people will say, oh, you're you're just being mean. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there's a sense that, well, as long as I'm on the right side, it doesn't matter how I speak. And really, the scripture gives us a way to do both. I think the second misconception is that that we can't be friends and love people with whom with whom we disagree, particularly on really secondary and tertiary things. And mm-hmm. so when we're talking about politics, for instance, and this is the nature of my disagreement with a, just a longtime good friend, we have the same values, but we may see things differently or how they should be applied, or we may even read the news in a different way or try to, you know, interpret things that way. And so we can have sharp disagreements, but also do it, respectfully and civilly. And and I think the other thing we forget is that like when we're on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, having disagreements, we're in public. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I try to do in in my disagreements is understand that people are watching me. So, you know, on Facebook, you know, I have several thousand friends. If I'm on Twitter, I have about 13,000 followers, which is not a ton, but that's, that's, you know, a minor league baseball stadium, right? So <laughs> right. If, would I say, in you, what words would I use if I was in public? Mm-hmm. If I'm having a disagreement with someone, I have to imagine myself not behind a keyboard, but on stage with someone else. And so that kind of should shape the way we think. And then I also, I, I just think what we have to do is understand that the people with whom we're disagreeing are not avatars or bots mm. for the most part. They're not, they're, they're real human people who have lives and are whole human beings. They're not avatars or pixels to be crushed. We might disagree with someone. They may actually be wrong about something. Mm -hmm. That's not the sum total of their existence. And so I think keeping all those things in mind helps us keep our conversation. So I actually think we can have strong, robust disagreements online if we keep those things in mind. Mm -hmm. And and to your last point about them not being bots, but they're actual human beings and they're actual human beings who had something happen to them that day that might have been bad or might have been especially good. Right. And it might affect how they're talking with you, typing with you that moment. And it might have been different if it had been yesterday or if it would be tomorrow, too. So we are people who have these experiences right. that come into that conversation. And, you know, we can't see what those things are or what they th- those things were. Yeah, very nice, very nice. Let me just take a moment to reset. For those who are just joining us, you're listening to Inside Out on Family Life. And today my guest is Daniel Darling, author of the book, Away With Words. Daniel, what do you think motivates us, Christians and non-Christians, to speak with certainty and judgment, even when we know we don't have all the facts, or maybe we don't even know that, but when we don't have all the facts, and if we thought about it, we could see how our words could be hurtful. So why do you think we go ahead with that kind of language? 
Um, I, I think there's a couple of things, you know, and, and like I was saying before, I think, you know, we have a tendency to, you know, forget that the people we're disagreeing with are human beings. Right. Uh, I also think there's a there's a passion, the passions of the age. We live in many ways in two different worlds, separate worlds where we get separate news. We have separate groups of friends that agree with us. There's mm-hmm. this, a lot of sociologists have studied this, that there's been kind of this big sorting of people into are we talking I about tribes left, here? Right. Or, oh, okay. All right. Okay. But I think it's more complicated than left, right. I think there's also the other divisions, you know, professional class and working class. I mean, there's a lot of divisions and there's a lot of incentives right now, financial incentives for folks to divide us, right? The, the social media platforms have algorithms that are intended to provoke division. Mm-hmm. The media companies, the large media companies, they want division, right? What what makes the headlines are things that are divisive, not things that are unifying. I, I think that's a factor. And it's never been easier to communicate. With a few taps of our thumbs or a few strokes of the keyboard, we can send a message to the world. We can respond. We can react. Mm-hmm. And this, this is why things are so divisive. But we as Christians don't have to be part of that. You know, we can seize this moment. I think we live in 2020, God has not called us to live in 1950. Mm-hmm. We're not going back, I don't think. I think the internet is going to be here to stay. So the question is, how do we steward this moment when it's never been easier to communicate? Uh, how do we steward our words in this moment? I would I would point to something like James 119 that says, let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. We might say in the internet age, let everyone be quick to get the whole story, slow to post, and slow to digital rage. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. I do. I do feel like the very beginnings of your book, especially it's all the way through the book, but the idea of slowing down is it's like foundational in what you're saying is that we don't lose by slowing down, not being reactive. Right. Now, I, I'm not yeah. telling you anything that everybody's Sunday school teacher didn't already say, but Christians are held to are held to a high standard and we're called to reach that standard, not on our own effort, but with the help of the Holy Spirit. He's our helper and our guide. So if, if Christians want a way to filter or test what we say or what we think we want to say or about to say, about to type, what questions might you pose for Christians, Christians listening right now, to ask themselves, to ask ourselves before we hit the post button or hit the send button? Well, I think there's several questions we need to ask ourselves. I think, first of all, ask ourselves, why Why are we doing this? Are we doing this because we really, God has given us something that we feel could be a help to other people, to a wider audience? If we're going to speak up about an issue that is really important, are we doing this because we really want to help educate folks? Or are we doing this because we're trying to signal to a certain group of people that we're on the right side and we're not with those other horrible people? Are we doing this to try to curate a, a version of ourselves that we find incomplete? So we're trying to present ourselves as something different than mm-hmm. who we really are. Why are we doing this is, I think, a good question. And I think the second thing we should ask ourselves is, do I have the whole story? Do I know everything about this? Is this a story that I, I know to be true or something that I want to be true? And those are mm-hmm. two very different things. Mm-hmm. And I think we need to really question our own biases. So... If I'm a conservative voter and something come, comes across the wire about the Democrats that confirms what I already think about them negatively, mm-hmm. we need to question ourselves and say, is this really true? Now, it may still be true, and it's perfectly fine to speak out about those things, but let's make sure things are true. If I'm a more progressive voter and something comes across bad about the president or about Republicans, I need to question my biases and say, is this something I really want to be true or just something I hope is true? Philippians 4 8 talks, uh, encourages us to think on those things that are true. If Christians are about the truth, we, we want to be wise in, in that. So do I know everything? And number three, do I understand that I'm in public and people can see what I'm saying? Am I choosing my words carefully? I think those three things are really good questions to ask. Mm-hmm. You uh, do a, a great job of giving us some, some pointers in, in your book. And one of those is, you know, are we known for love and is what I'm going to say coming from a heart of love? And a heart of love can speak hard things, but Mm -hmm. it ought not to be speaking untrue things. 
So I think in our conversation here, as brief as it has been, it kind of looks kind of bleak on social media, but I know you have hope. You, you believe that our online conversations can be for good. So what gives you hope? Well, a, a few things give me hope. I think number one, we talk a lot about the toxicity of social media and the internet, and, mm-hmm. and it is. And it's, it's very worrisome, misinformation, everything else. But I think there's a lot of good. I think it elevates voices that maybe were ignored before. I think it allows us to share good ideas and good good resources, uh, books, works of art, conferences. I've grown in my faith by finding resources that I've listened to mm-hmm. or read because someone's shared on. So it allows us also to elevate people, right? I think we can use it for good in the sense of like, we can elevate others. We can use our platforms to say, I really enjoyed this person or I really appreciate this person. We can encourage folks Mm -hmm. from afar. I can go on there and encourage somebody, Mm -hmm. send them a nice note and say, I really, I read this and I really enjoyed it. Or this post is so good. Thank you for doing this. We can also communicate the gospel around the world. Think about this age in which we live. Again, you know, God is not wringing his hands in heaven about the things that shake us. He's not shaken by what shakes us. And he's called us to live now. Doesn't mean we should be ignorant of the perils of technology, mm-hmm. but we also shouldn't be anti-technology and anti-innovation. You know, innovation is a act of creation. It's taking the raw materials and God has given us in innovating. And so I, all those things give me joy. And I, and I just think as Christians, as much as we can control it, we don't have to let it be bad. We mm. can make we can make the internet good mm-hmm. in some ways. Certainly during this time of coronavirus, which will be continuing on into the future, the ways in which we've been able to gather with people we care about as the church and as families wouldn't have been possible, wasn't possible in past pandemics. And that is something that I think everybody can embrace that, that there is good in being together as much as being together can happen. I know that right now for you in the Nashville area, the numbers are going up and it's going up here too. So I can go into this time, this this possible dark time, knowing that there are ways in which I have been able to stay in communication with people that can still help me in the future, even if we end up going into more seclusion again. And that there's a confidence in that. There's a there's a goodness in that. Yeah, I mean, this is this is so uncertain right now, right? We're uncertain in terms of where the what's going to happen with the virus. We're uncertain in terms of what's going to happen with government policy. Mm-hmm. We're uncertain about the next few months. Whichever side of the election you were on, there's uncertainty there. I mean, we have some hope. I think that vaccines and treatments are on the way. Uh, I do think we'll get back to normal at some point. I have confidence in that. I don't really listen to people say this is our new normal forever. I just don't, I just don't Mm -hmm. believe that. I don't think you can keep people away from each other forever, but it's definitely uncertain times and Christians are built for uncertain times. Mm -hmm. You know, our faith is built for uncertain times. We, we put our faith in the unshakable kingdom of God. And one of the things the pandemic has exposed is a lot of the things that we depended on that we thought were sure, the things we didn't even think about gatherings and events and and all sorts of things have been kind of taken from us and pulled out from under us in a way that's just weird and disorienting, which should, as Christians, make us fall back on the fact that the only sure thing in the world is is Christ. And mm-hmm. so as Christians, we're built for moments like this. We're built for crisis. God has not made a mistake by allowing these things to happen. Not to be trite, and I don't want to disregard anyone's suffering. We should lament over the state of the world. We should try to work for human flourishing and try to change policies and do what we can. But ultimately, our faith is in Christ, right? It says in the Psalms that we don't put our trust in chariots, right? We don't put our trust in governments, Mm -hmm. ultimately, or in science, whatever that nebulous term means these days. We put our faith in Christ. Mm. Yeah, that's a great word, a good word, and a good word to bring us to a close in this conversation. Thank you, Daniel, for joining me for this Inside Out Conversation. Well, thank you for having me. It's a joy. I really appreciate the ministry that you're doing there and uh, an honor to be to be featured here. Well, thank you. I've been talking with Daniel Darling, Senior Vice President for Communications for the National Religious Broadcasters and the author of the new book, Away With Words. You'll find a link to his book where you find Inside Out podcasts at fln.org slash inside out. 
I'm Martha Manikas Foster with Inside Out on Family Life. <laughs>